The presidents of uh, Russia, Kyrgyzstan, and Kazakhstan will visit Beijing this week in the run-up to the opening of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization Summit, which starts on Saturday in Qingdao. There are plenty of security issues looming as the geopolitical landscape changes in the Asia-Pacific and the Indo-Pacific. Korean nuclear talks are going ahead, the Belt and Road Initiative is growing, and the United States looks with a wary eye as China and others set their own course for the 21st century. To discuss these issues and more, I'm very happy to be joined in the Beijing studio by Juma Oktabayev, a former Prime Minister of Kyrgyzstan and the Suga Chairman of the China Pacific Economic Cooperation Council. We shall also speak to Atu Anija, Associate Editor of The Hindu on the telephone. That's our topic. This is a dialogue. I'm Yang Rai. Welcome to Dialogue. What are the major issues that may arouse attention from our friends in Central Asia regarding the upcoming SEO Summit in Qingdao? Mm. Uh, actually, uh, what we're observing is that the uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization is a very successful institution. So people expect from successful institutions to be even more successful. Uh, what we know that there will be more than dozens official documents to be signed. Uh, it will be eight people, eight president of the United States uh, around the table and this is a remarkable uh, achievement and uh, how these eight countries will be together, how they will be debating and discussing different ideas is crucially important. What is important, the dialogue is going on Central Asia just locating in between of three big powers, China, India, and Russia, and this uh, highly successful organization uh, we hope will generate much more ambitious agendas. The world is changing. What I would like to admit that uh, if we calculate on GDP on purchasing power parity, then Shanghai Cooperation Organization, eight countries, GDPs, exceeding G7 GDPs. So it's becoming bigger institutions than G7 and will go even further. So there's a lot, lot of expectations around the world on security issues, on economic issues, on further plans of uh, new eight uh, or institu uh, uh, countries and uh, we all hope that uh, we will have another impetus for the development of this organization. Central Asia is not only sandwiched uh, between the three major powers, Russia, India and China, but it's also an important part between Europe and Asia. And therefore, Dr. Brzezinski, former security advisor to the Carter administration said, whoever controls the Euro-Asia continent will control the future of, tom of the world tomorrow. So, what do you think are the major issues that His Excellency avoided somehow nicely uh, addressing this time around? Well, just now you mentioned the two uh, most important uh, persons. One is His Excellency, the former Prime Minister. The other is Brzezinski. They said, I basically uh, agree with what His Excellency has just uh, said. The SEO is a very important world organization. He started 17, 18 years ago, 2001, as just a small regional organization with intending to solve some of the border disputes and so on. However, over the years, because of the Shanghai spirit, which lays emphasis on mutual trust, political trust, and which laid on cooperation, coordination, economic win-win and also people-to-people -people contact. So three years the organization has grown. And just now you also mentioned Brzezinski. Dr. Brzezinski, he looks at this region from the American way of looking at the world. Who controls the region? Then you are in control of the world. However, now people in the three, I mean the members of this organization, somehow I would feel that we look at the situation in somewhat a different way. Because we would feel that, as you rightfully mentioned, Central Asia, 
is a has the strategic importance of serving as a pivotal uh, uh, like region linking both Europe and the economic vital Asia Pacific. So if we all these <coughs> countries contribute to each other, we share with each other, then we will all benefit from this enlarged economic Yes, indeed, the population total and economic total of uh, SCO surpass uh, the G7, yeah. both. Uh, let me get over to uh, Mr. Atu Neja. Uh, what do you think of uh, uh, what Ambassador Suga says on the future and dynamics of SCO? He only spoke of uh, two issues cooperation and coordination without mentioning yet another potentially very challenging aspect that is a uh, competition mm -hmm. a competition not only between India and China but on the issue of a Euro Asia Economic Union perhaps the Russians have their own considerations what do you think of the idea of a competition uh, too? Yeah, uh, I think uh, that the momentum towards cooperation is stronger uh, and can override the potential competition which you spoke about with. because if you look at the big picture uh, we see that both flanks of Eurasia in a way uh, undergoing a very important structural change uh, you can see very recently the visit of the German Chancellor Merkel to China which I think is extremely significant in the light of the bigger picture which is the problems arising between China and the United States, problems arising between India and the United States, and in fact problems arising between Japan and the United States. So in a way there is a structural breach, a post-war breach which is taking place on the Atlantic Alliance. And we see that both flanks, I would say the western flank would be Europe and the eastern flank being the Koreas, all undergoing a major change. And India comes somewhere in the, in the middle and is sensing this larger change geopolitical change which is taking place and looking for opportunities within. And that explains uh, the Wuhan summit which Prime Minister Modi and President Xi had. And that also in a way explains the meeting in Sochi which Mr. Modi and uh, President Putin had. Uh, and, and so uh, we are, uh, there is a new shift in the Indian perception as well looking far more intently at Eurasia and which would include Central Asia right in the middle of that than it was before. So a fundamental shift taking place, huge opportunities. Once we have the framework right then and the security right, then we look at opportunities rather than competition. Yes, we indeed, we are raising yeah. seismic changes uh, mm -hmm. in the process of uh, geopolitical reconfiguration in the wake of uh, 911, if not the Cold War. However, a new Cold War is descending upon the Euro-Asian continent somehow. If you can look at the geopolitical competition between the two biggest economies, the United States and China, to what degree do you think uh, the idea of SEO can somehow rebalance uh, the uh, arrogance of a superpower like uh, Washington, uh, the pullout of the United States from so mon many multilateral agreements uh, may raise concerns about sustainability of globalization. Your president is uh, currently in Beijing. Uh, what do you think uh, will be discussed uh, in this uh, broad context? Uh, if you look to the bigger picture, indeed the world now is not in very, how to say, it, safe situation with all kind of threats, all kind of challenges ahead of us, and mainly bigger powers involved to this kind of power struggle economic power struggle, military power struggle, which is not necessarily should be happening in our globalized world. So Shanghai Cooperation Organization is doing very right things. What it is about is about a common future, shared future between all human beings, all countries around the world. You, you find yourself repeating the same concept that President Xi Jinping put forward a community of a shared future. Yes. Uh, do you yes. think uh, all our partners in Central Asia buy this idea? No. First of all, the uh, interconnectivity and the yeah. inclusiveness of uh, yes, SEO. Yes. So, people in Central Asia, of course, are looking for cooperation between each other and with outside world. 
uh, and of course uh, it should be healthy competition uh, between countries, between different uh, approaches, but it should be uh, kind of uh, peaceful, agreeable way of doing things together. Central Asia is landlocked region, and for the landlocked regions you need uh, crossing of different trade routes, different communication routes, like it wasn't during the old Silk Road glory years. That is why we are saying that if big countries in Shanghai Cooperation Organization, India, China, Russia, would cooperate together, it would happen through Central Asia. And in, uh, I would like to underline that about 90% of world GDP generated from the areas which is just 100 kilometers from the shores. And about 90% of population live uh, in 100 kilometers from the shores. What does it mean that in landlocked regions it's not easy to make business? In Chinese landlocked provinces you see that migration, economic growth is not as it should be. So Central Asia is just uh, would be the example when the new land bridges would bring this region to even more. The Belt and Road Initiative of President Xi Jinping not only covers the land Silk Road but also maritime Silk Road. Yeah. That is why the United States somehow raised the idea of uh, uh, freedom of navigation and the freedom of uh, overflight in the South China Sea. So whatever China and Russia do, our moves would always be viewed as a, a challenge to the primacy of American leadership, hence the change of the name of Pacific Fleet from Pacific Fleet to Indo-Pacific Fleet. Mm. Uh, the headquarters of Pacific Fleet underwent this change somehow to raise a, or convey a broad message mm -hmm. as opposed to perhaps SEO. I'm sorry for setting the tone of a new Cold War, but yeah. it is perhaps what the hawks in the Pentagon really want, mm. Ambassador Shuga. Well, that's a very good perspective to look at things. Uh, but my feeling is that uh, our mindset has to go along, has to move along with the changing times. That is just now you mentioned that you have very good analogy. You said that the Cold War and that during which the people would develop some kind of mindset, uh, like Cold War mentality sometimes we, 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 as we, 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 we call it. My feeling is that if you look at you know, judging other people's motives and thinking using your old using the old Cold War mindset, of course the uh, outcome, uh, the conclusion will be different. But for instance, nowadays I agree with the, uh, His Excellency the Prime Minister that uh, Eurasia, uh, the Central Asia and some uh, big uh, countries like Russia, India, China, we have a very important shared national interests. How we can make the economic pie larger, that's going to benefit us all. Because this region is a look at this region. This region, like Shanghai Community uh, uh, Cooperation Organization, just uh, the comprise, a, uh, the covers an area which is equal, uh, it's a little larger than one fourth of the world's total area. As for GDP, it exceeds one fourth. And as for population, it exceeds the 42 percent. So, such like if this uh, region somehow we can have, we can uh, put uh, what we can brain, uh, brainstorm, we can uh, uh, co, uh, we can uh, cooperate and cons consult with each other and bring some uh, uh, new uh, blueprints for the future. Mm -hmm. And indeed, we are moving towards an area. A, a, a we are moving towards the concept, the realization of the concept of a shared future of the region and indeed paving way for the future of shared future for mankind. Yes, indeed, it is, it is eventually an idea of how to pursue cool prosperity. Yeah. You are watching dialogue with Ambassador Suga, His Excellency uh, Mr. Ottobaya, former Prime Minister of Kyrgyzstan, and Mr. Uh, Atu. An um, Indian correspondent based in Beijing, we are discussing ideas and issues of a Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the summit, the 18th of its kind, that will soon take place in the coastal city of Shandong province. Stay with us, we'll be right back.
Welcome back, gentlemen. Now, let me go back to uh, two. What do you think are the major issues uh, that um, leaders of the SCO will discuss in Qingdao? And to what degree do, do you think that India will make its own in mass contributions? Well, uh, it's hard to get specifically uh, what they would, they would talk, but I I'm sure there are some broad themes which are already there in the open. One, of course, is security, which means counter-terrorism. Uh, we already have SEO advance on that track with a counter-terrorism center already opened in Uzbekistan. Uh, there are going to be military exercises, I'm told, later in the year uh, of all member states. So security flank would obviously be one. What I'm personally very keen is to see in terms of economic projects. If you recall uh, when President Xi and Mr. Modi met in Wuhan, they spoke about a project in Afghanistan, a joint project of India, China, and Afghanistan. I'm sure in areas like uh, alternative energy, uh, in terms of oil and gas, there are so many areas where, uh, as your other speakers have mentioned, uh, Central Asia is so resource rich. Can we look now uh, at a collaboration in terms of specific projects and would that be something which would be sort of flat uh, during the SEO summit? I'm personally hoping that we would move beyond security and move into the economic domain as Thank well. you so much, Atu. That's exactly also a concern, a concern that Mr. Putin, Russian president, uh, raised uh, in an exclusive interview that uh, President Shen Haishun, head of the Me China Media Group, uh, conducted in Moscow. Uh, Mr. Putin put his hand on the following issues, such as uh, innovation, digital technology, and infrastructure, other than China's concerns on traditional security or uh, non-conventional threats, such as uh, the three evil forces, separatism, terrorism, and extremism. And do you think we have a lot of margin for such maneuvers in uh, the area of digital technology and innovation? Because uh, to our knowledge, we have been talking about uh, traditional barter trade, uh, investment, but digital technology was spoken of by President Vladimir Putin in Moscow. Uh, we should not forget that we are living in the middle of fourth industrial revolution. Those countries and regions which will be following up and pioneering innovation, they will be leaders of future world. It's obvious for everyone. And indeed, all countries, especially the bigger ones of Shanghai Cooperation Organization, put as a, their own priorities to invest and to develop innovative economics. And communication, cooperation between those uh, countries, especially in the view of uh, good fundamental sciences achievements of all of these uh, big and smaller countries, would bring the region to the new dimension. We are proud to see that in India, in China, in Russia, as well as in Central Asia, the some achievement on that area. It must be done. It's part of broader economic cooperation area. These days, science and technology not recognizing any borders, so it's very natural to establish some kind of uh, future plans for joint communication cooperation. <coughs> but nobody should forget uh, security concerns. If you forget security concerns, that uh, probably the economic ideas would be useless. So Shanghai Cooperation Organization should demonstrate to outside world there is mutual understanding on the vision among the countries on the security issues. I would like to remind that 17 years ago, Shanghai Cooperation Organization was created based on security matters and is moving ahead with this uh, area, like military exercises, like joint consultations on different issues. The world is not getting safer, as you mentioned. So uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization should be realistic on that matter as well. Ambassador Su, the SCO summit, the 18th of its kind in Qingdao, may be put into a collision course with the United States over one issue. The Persian state of Iran has not been included yet in the SCO framework. Probably it's on the agenda 
uh, to be deliberated by all members uh, for its application. Given the impact of the U.S. pullout from the Iran nuclear deal, the, uh, the 6 plus 1 nuclear deal, uh, and also I was told that uh, Iranian President Rouhani will soon be visiting China, do you think um, SCO will somehow become what the Americans and the Europeans call semi-NATO military bloc that would be used to counter the influence of NATO despite the end of the Cold War in 1991, Ambassador Su. That's an excellent and also very sophisticated question. Let me just say this. The actually, uh, we, we, we should start with what kind of organization the IC, uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization is. It's not a NATO-like uh, organization it's not like a Warsaw Pact organization, but it's an organization which started as an organization to settle border disputes, and then it grew through mutual consultation, through political trust, and then now the areas of cooperation expands, as His Excellency just mentioned, from security issues to economic, and then to people-to-people -people contact society, to green economy, and to the fourth elements of the new industrial uh, revolution and uh, technical revolution, so on and so forth. And that being said, I, I would say that the, this organization started uh, with the so-called Shanghai Five, and then the members were expanded, and now you have the observer states, and uh, you, you also have some states you, 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 uh, uh, you, you and being invited. I Iran, if invited, that was uh, within the framework, general fr framework. It's not that the Shanghai organization, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, will invite Iran just to deter the influence of the United States. It's not that, because a part of the uh, organization that uh, this time the Indian, the Pakistan, the new states. And we have some observers, like uh, Mongo in, uh, Mongolia is an observer, it's not a full member of it. So this time, and if even uh, Iran, is invited. I think that uh, if we look at from the positive side, I think it would, uh, through uh, consultation on an equal basis, uh, is going to add, to contribute to regional stability. Despite the uh, importance of China's uh, role as one of the P5 in the UN Security Council, yeah. Shanghai Cooperation Organization is the only one that is named after a major city in China. Yeah. What do you think of the Chinese diplomacy these few years uh -huh. uh, in the broad uh, context of a geopolitical rivalry, quote unquote, between the United States and China? The United States is obsessively concerned about China's fast catch up, uh -huh. particularly in the area of digital technology, and that is an important part of the trade war. What we see today is the only tip of the iceberg uh, and the courage of whatever uh, competitions that the two biggest economies are having is a it takes a few days to clarify, but what do you think of China's diplomacy to guarantee our uh, security of the external conditions so that we will focus on domestic politics, domestic economics, and, and as Mr. Xi Jinping says, we are very close to the dream of uh, national rejuvenation, right? Yeah. Uh, th that's also a very good question. When you look at China's diplomacy, and then uh, the trade friction is on one spot on the big canvas. But if you step back a little bit, you see the whole picture. You can see that China, the diplomacy can fall into big, four big areas. The first one is a major country relationship. And the China wants to maintain good cooperative relationship with Russia, with the United States. We still want to have a normal uh, cooperative uh, relations, win-win and non-confrontational uh, relationship. And then China's relationship, the second part is China wants to enhance a good neighboring policy. And the third part is China wants to extend good relations with all other developing world. The fourth is China is going to promote a multilateral 
diplomacy, this Shanghai Cooperation Organization is, is one. So I think China's diplomacy serves as the textbook of international relations, which say all foreign policy would serve domestic politics because China domestically we have all important five agendas, economic cooperation, betterment of the society, uh, liable, uh, livelihood of the people and so on. But internationally we want to together with other countries push for uh, new type of international relationship and uh, uh, cooperation in, in our but world scale. Really our idea about having a new type of major power relationship with the United States has been rejected by <laughs> President Trump and his predecessor, Mr. Uh, Barack Obama. Uh, by the end of our uh, discussion here, Your Excellency, what do you think of the emerging importance of multilateralism as opposed to the unilateral approach by the uh, Trump administration, particularly in uh, the big picture of globalization? Whatever he says is aims to put America first. Yeah, um, I think that it is uh, kind of a uh, very short uh, term approach world is getting global, much more global than the, in the past. You can't develop uh, any country, any region without cooperation, communication and efficient trade. And competition is important. If you stop in competition by isolating yourself, you start declining even more quicker. The uh, name of the game is who is competitive. The problem with United States is that in few areas that country lost competitiveness. And so they try to protect whatever areas, whatever industries by putting barriers, which is a way to nowhere. And China, as a competition, economic competition number one to the United States, demonstrated a completely different approach. Openness, communication, cooperation, joint, multilateralism, free market, free exchange, whatever. Why? Because China can allow it to do it because it's highly competitive. In other words, perhaps, what is going on between the United States, European Union and the United States is the protection of losers in the process of globalization. That is a hotbed for the rise of populism and protectionism. President Trump is one case in point. We're going to have most of such discussions on the impact of Trump, a maverick in world economics. See you next time. Thank you.